Okay, so Ms. Marvel is now at an end, and throughout this video, we're going to be going over the finale, discussing the Easter eggs in it, and also breaking down what we liked and didn't like about the season. Huge apologies for missing last week's episode. One of my kids had a hospital appointment on the morning. Everything's fine, we're all good, but it kind of shifted the schedule a bit, and then I went to see Thor on Thursday, so it had a big knock on effect. Still, though, I did really enjoy the episode, even if I was sat there for a good part of it, like, are we the baddies? Now this told a lot of the backstory of Aisha. We discovered how she met Kamala's great grandfather, who wooed her with poetry. But I'm not a rapper. We also saw how she escaped the British soldiers after leaving the temple. Really great opening that I think was one of the high points in the season. Unfortunately, it came to a tragic end and had Aisha being murdered by Najma at the train station. Now due to Kamala travelling back in time, she managed to save her grandmother during the partition, which we heard about earlier on in the season. Typically in the Marvel Universe, when you travel back in time, this alters something and it creates a branch that then builds a variant timeline. In order to keep these to a minimum, the TVA would constantly intervene, but we didn't see them pop up in this entry. Now this is because this is a fixed point in time that's part of a self-fulfilling loop. In theoretical physics, this is known as the bootstrap paradox and it basically involves the past creating an event in the future that then starts its creation in the past. For example, let's say that one day a time traveller discovers a book on their doorstep that tells them how to build a time machine. They then do this and using the machine they travel back in time and then leave the book on their doorstep so that their past self can pick it up and use it to build a time machine. Everything all plays out in one big loop and this event of Kamala saving her grandmother was always supposed to happen which is why it didn't cause any issues. The idea of a partition was of course also reflected in Najma. The partition itself was a massive refugee crisis that destroyed many homes because the British Empire completely f***ed everything up. Borders were created across India and this is mirrored in the clandestines who had their own crisis with crossing borders that led to a lot of destruction. Now back in the present the portal was open but it led to the death of Najma. Early on we were told that you needed two bangles to properly open everything up and this could explain why the clandestines ended up clan and fodder. Her, her, her essence then travelled into Cameron and we also got the idea that Ms. Marvel had her identity secured when her mother found her necklace showing her symbol. Back in Jersey, we saw Brian, so Bruno and Cameron meeting. Damage control showed up and it didn't exactly control the damage. I thought my jokes were bad. Now the episode itself is titled No Normal, which was the name of the first graphic novel featuring the character. This is what the full series is based on and we open up in Jersey, which is where that comic was set. Circle Q has been pretty much destroyed, but in the source material, Kamala actually did this when she tried to save Bruno from getting robbed by his brother. Damage controller inspecting the scene, and we get Agent Diva saying this is what happens when the wrong people get powers. Now this is meant to be because she, she's basically a racist, I think, as she's done a couple of microaggressions in the series, and she doesn't take her shoes off in the mosque. They also have a bit where she assumes that the Sheikh is quoting the Quran when he's actually doing Abraham Lincoln. She quickly says that she means kids and she wants to take him in alive, which is when we cut to Cameron and Bruno out on the subway. Last week his powers manifested when the drone arrived and he sort of goes wild in this episode. Now Cameron in the comics wasn't an human who gained bioluminescent powers after being exposed to Terrigen Mist. Cameron was a genius whose families were friends with the cons and when Cameron was a kid, but they moved away for several years. When they returned in his teens, Cameron ended up being exposed to the mist, which basically transformed certain people into inhumans. This activated his abilities, and he transformed into a pale blue being that was able to emit powerful energy. Now, though he was a love interest for Kamala, he also ended up becoming a villain, and he worked with the bad guy lineage. When Najma first showed up, I thought that she would be based on this, but big L on that fan theory. See you, chump. Now we then get the title sequence, and over this we can hear Captain Space by Janubi Kargosh. Cut to the Statue of Liberty, which we last saw at the end of No Way Home. This was brought up by Elena Belova and Hawkeye as well, and it's its classic green, rather than being the copper that it was after its restoration. It's difficult to tell exactly when the show is set, and there have been a lot of conflicting things from the creative team about the general timeline. We know that the show is obviously set after Endgame, but beyond that, it's estimated that this takes place in 2024, one year after Endgame, with No Way Home being fall in winter of 2024 too. The shield isn't there either, so I imagine it's probably around the time of Far From Home, but let me know below if you know different, because you guys are the real heroes. 
Now at this point, Kamala makes an announcement that she's Nightlight to her family. I am Wade. No, I'm Nightlight. Oh my god! I had no idea! Otoba! <laughs> You told them already. They already know, and we discover that the gossip got around quickly in the house because Abu always has his phone on speaker. This is similar to the reveal in the comics in which she went to tell her mother, but she already knew. She said that she didn't actually mind her sneaking out if it was to help people, and it was a nice mother and daughter moment. Now they start asking how her powers work, and even bring up her almost dropping the kid, which happened at the end of episode 2. It's very much a coming out for her, and her parents are over the moon and so proud of her. Clearly they care. And I wish my parents had been like that when I told them I broke records when bringing out breakdowns. Instead, they kicked me out of the house and said they wish they'd had a son like Emergency Awesome. And at this point, Nakia FaceTimes Kamala to tell her Bruno is missing. We then get the title sequence, which is back to being in English after Urdu and Hind were used last week. Amongst the quick flashes, we can catch the Sloth Baby Productions video from episode 1 with Captain Marvel flying in. There's also a high school sweater with Ms. Marvel established 2014. Well actually, Ms. Marvel appeared in 2013 in a Captain Marvel comic, but her own series started in 2014, so we'll let you off. The Zen Circle Q, a school bus, a cast, a Nokia 3310 screen, a damage control car, a train station sign, and this of course all reflects what's happening in the episode. Lastly, we get the newer and cut to Kamala's room, where we can see amongst the posters of Captain Marvel that a desktop also has Carol's symbol on it. Carol ends up appearing at the end of the episode in the post credit scene, which we'll talk about later on in the video. Maniba comes in with a toffee box, which was the same thing that the bangle was sent in by her grandmother. We saw these boxes littered her home in episode 4, and inside is her costume that's built to reflect certain things given to her throughout the series. Waleed gave Kamala the blue vest, Kareem gave her the red scarf, she got the bangle from her grandmother, and the mask from Bruno. The final piece was the necklace, which Maniba found with her symbol on it. These all come together to form her costume, and it's one of my favourite ones in Phase 4. She then runs through the city, hopping on platforms, similar to the mobile game that Bruno played earlier in the series. She then stops at the Grove Street sign. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. After the train derail, Bruno decides to go to the mosque, which Nakia says is a bad idea due to all the surveillance that the place will be under, due to America being suspicious of the religion. She's right too, as damage controls show up, and everyone has their IDs ready, because they've been through this kind of thing with the government several times before. They do play some of it tongue in cheek, and even have a fake out where Nakia pretends to hide her boyfriend, and this buys Bruno and Cameron time to escape. They end up wearing caps, which we've seen throughout the MCU, or what people put on to go incognito, and this has showed up in movies like Winter Soldier and Ant-Man and the Wasp. Unfortunately, Cameron's powers are too much, and he starts to overcharge. They head to the high school, and Kamala rings Kareem, and he tells her that he can get the ladder out if she makes it to the harbour at midnight. The friendship group reunite, and even Zoe comes in to help. Turns out she's been filming her TikToks in the school, and we learned earlier in the season that she'd been posting a lot about Nightlight, which helped Damage Control track her down. Zoe sort of goes on the same mark that she did in the comics, and though she initially started off as, as a bit of a, a douche, over the series she ended up siding with Kamala. They start to plan stuff out, which allows the creative team to really flourish, and I think the design elements like this are what have really elevated the show. It shines when they're doing stuff like this, and they foreshadow a lot of the battle here. We can see skeletons and hoodies, which are all sketched out. The hoodies are used to make everyone look the same, and it's basically a Home Alone bit. Now the skeleton itself is given a knife and a grey wig, and this is clearly riffing on Psycho, namely how Norman Bates had his mother. We also see Damage Control's guns on the outside, which too showed up in the She-Hulk trailer. This show is going to be releasing next month, and it'll be interesting to see how this all lines up. Now as we saw earlier in the series, these sonic weapons can knock people out in a non-lethal way, and I'm expecting them to show up again. Diva is told to evacuate, but being the chump she is, she ignores this and sends the team in. Over the top of this, we can hear the song Anthem by the Sweatshop Boys, and it's a bloody banger. These actually got mentioned earlier in the series in a conversation with Kamala and Cameron, and this itself pulled directly from the comics. I love how everyone kind of uses the powers that they have in order to beat them, and Zoe being a TikTok star, sends this out to draw people in. Now as they run through the school, we see a mural that includes Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Mother Teresa, and also Gandhi. There's also what I think is Michelle Obama and Mohammed Rafiq Tara, but let me know if I'm wrong, as it's a bit difficult to make them out just from this shot. Now Kamala and Cameron see that their powers can combine, and Bruno interrupts them almost kissing. Should have done what I would have done and snitched on Cameron, cause I'm King Cock Block. That's quite a fun chase scene, but Kamala is obviously hiding from Cameron that his mother's dead, and looking like that skeleton with the wig on. 
Cameron isn't too happy that she's gone, and this makes him go full supervillain, which pits him against Kamala. She does a giant hand similar to how she does in the comics, and they slowly start to line her powers up more with the source material. One of the big complaints throughout the series is how they've changed these up from the comics, but by the end, she's pretty accurate to that, and even says Embiggen. Though there is the hard light still being used, her body and hands will shapeshift, and this scene feels like it's ripped right out of the comics and the Avengers game. Cameron runs outside, and after damage controls start to fire on him, Kamala jumps in and saves the day. They bring out the sonic cannons, and I believe that this is similar to the devices used in The Incredible Hulk. This leads to a big fight, with a one-shot take of Cameron tearing through damage control. He's going wild, whereas Kamala is finessed, and using her powers to stop people being hurt. Eventually, he goes into full meltdown mode, and Kamala has to close in on him. She says that Najma sent everything she had to protect him, but yeah, I don't know if Najma's plan makes all that much sense in the end. Anyway, the inside of this structure they form is also like the newer, which of course ties back to the general bad thing that was on the horizon. Now, she gives him a route to the harbour, and I'm guessing that he'll pop up again soon. We see him heading to the restaurant that the Red Daggers operate out of, and this will likely lead to his training. There are theories that he might get recruited by Val as part of the Thunderbolts, but I think he's more likely going to end up siding with the Red Daggers, even though they were enemies with the clandestine. Anyway, Kamala is blowing up on TikTok, and we even get G. Willow Wilson dropping one. This character was named after the author of the same name, who wrote the No Normal graphic novel. We also get one that might be a reference to Star Wars Kid. Is that him? I think it might be. Also, apologies for my voice at the moment. Got COVID, uh, feel fine, but my voice is just knacked, so... Yeah, th this is why the video is bad. It was going to be bad anyway, to be fair, but this is my excuse this time. Anyway, she's a viral hit. Everyone loves her. Even the kid who she saved at the end of episode two. She's a superhero for the Muslim community. And hey, nice to have this moment where she finally finds her own identity and form of acceptance. That night, her father tells her that if she saves one life, she saves the entire world. This is somewhat playing on the quote from the Torah, which was used at the end of Schindler's List, and it was molded into being used on Aunt May's gravestone at the end of No Way Home and the Spider-Man PS4 game. Abu tells her Kamala means perfect, which is the literal meaning for it, but he also brings up how Kamal means Marvel. He calls her their own Ms. Marvel, and hey, they, they, they said it! A cut to Kamala sitting on a lamppost, which is based on a comic cover from her solo series. Jump to one week later, and we see Bruno wearing the Gigawatt t-shirt that he also wore in the comics. He's now driving Cameron's car, and you just need to steal his girl, and you've got it made. Now from here comes one of the big oh sh** moments in the episode. Turns out he's scanned her genetic makeup, and he's discovered that she's actually a mutant. We even get the X-Men musical Sting, that too appeared in the Multiverse of Madness. Like a mutation. Now in the comics, Kamala was an inhuman, but they've definitely changed this up here, along with her powers. Inhumans were basically what Marvel tried to push instead of the X-Men in the comics because, at the time, they didn't own the movie rights. However, they've got them back now, which is why the Inhumans have kind of been put on the back foot. Now, whether they will explore this more remains to be seen, but I'm guessing that this is the ushering in of mutants and that they'll be shifting a lot of the Inhuman characters over to being them instead. Black Bolt just took another mind-blowing L, and potentially they will shift towards this. Now, this could also allow them to introduce Professor X, and potentially, Kamala could even end up going to him for training. I'd love it if they revealed that mutants had existed the entire time, much like how they did with Kamala. It would be great if it turned out we just didn't know about them, and the school had been operating unbeknownst to most of the world. Even Bruno scanning her didn't pick this up the first time, and Kamala could be used as a gateway to the X-Men. We do have San Diego Comic Con coming up next week, where we're rumoured to be getting more of the plan going forward. However, Kamala has to star in the Marvels first, and we get a big hint towards this with the appearance of Captain Marvel in the post credit scene. Kamala's bangle lights up and starts to glow, and she then swaps places with Carol. This to me confirms that they are indeed the Nagabands, and this has a lot of basis in the comics. The Nagabands were basically Kree artifacts that delved into the negative zone, or as it's known here, the Nua, the Nuga, the, the nu Nugative zone. Now in the comics, Rick Jones and Captain Marvel also use them as gateways to swap places with each other. For example, we'd get what we basically have here, where they swap back and forth but never exist together in the same scene. Now it's going to be interesting to see how they interact because of this, and where Kamala actually is now. She's across the cosmos somewhere, whilst Carol is stuck in her number one fan's room. Bit creepy. Now I have no idea how this is triggered, but they're clearly leaning into the comics, and setting things up to match that, where the band swap places with other people. Who knows, Kamala might even be with her right now, on the opposite side of this, in the negative zone, instead of being across space. 
Carol, however, doesn't have the other bangle, and I was kind of hoping they'd reveal where she found the opposite one. Either way, we know the Marvels is coming soon, and that it's going to star her, Kamala, and Photon, who was last seen in WandaVision. There's been lots of warps in reality that the three have had to deal with, and I'm guessing that this will bring them together. Great way to end the episode anyway, with a lot of questions for the future. Now in her room, we can also catch an Iron Man helmet too, so hey, maybe they'll pull Riri Williams into this too somehow, as we know she's going to be popping up in Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever. Oh no. Now as for my thoughts on the season, I kind of have mixed feelings on it, but I don't know if it's just how I'm feeling about Phase 4 in general. Everything feels kind of directionless, and when you look back at Phase 1, Phase 2, and Phase 3, they all felt like they were building towards something in their own individual phases. I think Phase 4 could have been heading towards more multiversal things, but it doesn't really feel that way overall. I also think that the show has been limited by Marvel's Disney Plus formula quite a lot. They keep sticking to six episodes and it just makes shows suffer so much in my opinion. The first two episodes tend to be really badly paced in a lot of these shows and I think in the case of Hawkeye, Loki, Moon Knight and this, you could have just combined elements from both, put them together in one entry and not really missed anything. The final episode always feels like a bit of a rush and I wish they'd pace the series out a bit more so we're not spending ages in Act 1 and trying to get to the big stuff. Saying that though, I did enjoy Ms. Marvel. I think that all the cast did a stellar job and that they really handled the material well. Lots of clear love and appreciation for the rich cultures here and even side characters like Kamala's parents get lots of really well developed arcs and character moments. However, I do feel that the film plot was pretty weak overall and that they kind of shoehorned in a lot of stuff for the end but I didn't mind too much because the main characters were so well handled. I really hope that going forward that Marvel looks at shows like Umbrella Academy, The Boys and Stranger Things and that they decide to start making their shows a lot longer. Eight episodes would be a sweet spot and we've seen things like The Mandalorian that work really well because of this. Just that bit of extra time would mean that the ending isn't so tacked on and I think it would really help these shows knock it out of the park instead of just being serviceable. Now obviously the elephant in the room is that I'm a 33 year old white guy complaining about a TV show made for teenagers that can relate to a lot more of the cultural aspects than I can. That's kind of why I've tried to focus my criticism on things about the MCU shows that I have, rather than going over the actual story which I do think was good. The bangle plot, time travel and just Kamala in general worked really well, I just wish that the entire thing was structured better. Now I do think this is one of the stronger Disney Plus entries, but I also think there's problems with it because of the format that they seem to be sticking to. After One Division did 9 episodes and had much more eyes on it than most of the other entries, I have hoped that they realise this and decide to shift gears. Overall though, Ms. Marvel was a fun time, and I am excited to see Kamala's return in the Marvels. Now I'd of course love to hear your thoughts, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We're running a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of Everything Everywhere all at once on the 15th, and all you have to do to be able the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the season. If you pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at HeavySpoilers. If you want some else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the boys, which will be linked on screen right now. Such a good season, lots of cool easter eggs in it, and definitely head over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.